This is Linda Shelton, and we're in Nodum, Utah, and we're interviewing Sharon Robison Lusco. Lusco. It is February 19th, 2012. <laughs> well, Sharon, we are so glad you're you're willing to do this. Thank you very much. And just tell us a little about yourself to start out. Sure. Oh, more comfortable. well, about myself. Well, That's a hard one. Thanks, Jen. The, the Lusco is very interesting because mm -hmm. my husband's folks came from Europe. He was first generation, and it was Luchka. Oh. And they came from, what is now Eastern Czechoslovakia. It was the Austro-Hungarian Empire when they came over. Wow. So that's an interesting heritage in itself. Yes. He came out hunting uranium, and we met, and... Uh, that's how I got Lusco for a name. <laughs> your, and what's your husband's first name? Donald. Donald Lusco. Mm -hmm. What was his experience like? Uh, was he mining for uranium? Uh, when he got out of the military, his brother was had heard about Pick and Steen, you know, the, the uranium bonanza. Yes. And he yes. decided he wanted to come out and get his fortune out of oh, uranium. Wow. And my husband... So I can't let my brother go out there to the Wild West all alone. <laughs> and he was just newly married. And so he came out, and they were here around Hanksville mm -hmm. about a year before we met. Oh. Did they have any success? They had some, but that was uh -huh. the tail end of the boom, mm -hmm. and there was not the demand. Mm -hmm. And so his family went on to, to Arizona and got back in the building game, which is what they did. And Great. And that was in the 50s? Mm-hmm. The late 50s, and, and about 55 is when he came out. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, where were you born? I was born in Price. My folks were living in Hanksville, and they went to Price, Utah. So oh, that's, that's where right. I was you yeah. have to make that drive for mm -hmm. the medical care, huh? That's... Then, yes. Wow. Wow. So born in Price, your parents lived in Hanksville. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about your family. I'm the only child. Oh. Uh, I was a C-section. And back then, they did not know much about such things. And when my mother was pregnant with the second child, uh, they didn't move fast enough. And the baby lived about an hour with oh. the third child. Oh, I and she was right there at the hospital, but they let her go into labor. She shouldn't have. And, uh, and the uterus split open. Oh, she, my goodness. My mother almost died. But anyway, that was... So I'm an only child. And they lost that third baby. They lost baby. that little girl. A oh. little boy and a little girl. How hard for your parents. It was. I remember my mother crying and crying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My goodness. And what was your childhood like growing up in Hanksville, huh? Well, uh, we were there in Hanksville, and I just remember that my dad had an old, what they call the pool hall. It's a big false front green building. It's gone now. And uh, just played in the dirt with all the rest of the kids. When I, <clears throat> but my folks were worried about schooling, and so my father sold his property, and we moved and bought a farm in Green River. He went to work on the railroad later bought a grocery store and I went to school in Green River. And when I was 16, I guess they got, I don't know what you call homesick or whatever. He sold our farm, he'd sold the store, and we came back to this country. Hmm. Interesting. Education was important to them. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I, I hear that so many times that there were big sacrifices by parents so their kids could go to school. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about your school in Green River? Well, okay, I can tell you an adventure in the first grade. Every spring, they'd go out in the hills and pick flowers. <coughs> Excuse me. And for some reason, I was elected May Queen, or whatever you might want to call it, and they set me on this chair and had all of these wildflowers around me. My eyes swelled shut. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. You had allergies. Oh, terrible. And I just sat there and wondered when this is going to be over. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> the May Queen had hay fever. Did <laughs> she ever? You no, know, mostly going to school. I, I liked the drama. and. Uh, 
and I had some teachers that, that encouraged dancing, things like that. I like to paint. I like music, things like that, and that got me through school. Wow. Otherwise, I thought, oh, on the first day of school, I thought, I'll never do 12 years of this. <laughs> <laughs> you liked your freedom. I did. We lived on a farm along the Green River, and I had the freedom and cats and dogs and could wander all over. It was lovely. What were some of the pets that you remember? Oh, I had a dog named Cricket. He was a border collie. He had the mumps when I did. And I didn't know dogs got mumps. Well, I didn't either, but he did. He <laughs> swelled up on one side beautifully. <laughs> my mother tended us both. <laughs> wow. Anyway, he was my buddy, and I missed him, and I had lots of cats. Have yeah, fun. I loved them, too. They probably gave me allergies, but I didn't know what to That's <laughs> right. That's right. To the magpie talked, and that was fun. Now, were there other children that lived near you? Uh, oh, about eighth of a mile down the road. Mm -hmm. There was a, another family with children. Children had one boy <laughs> my age, and occasionally. But, you know, back then, you worked. So you said, Mother, uh, can I go play in Jessie's house for an hour? She'd call Mrs. Powell up. But, yes, you can go over for an hour. You go and play it for about an hour. And once in a while, you get a half an hour out of it, but then you went home. Wow. Because he had work to do, and I didn't have any work to do. I was an only child. <laughs> but that was kind of how it was. No, there wasn't any. The next door neighbor was a school teacher lady, and my folks ran a store, so I'd go next door, and she had a big stack of funny books. I'd sit by her stairs and read those if I got lonesome. Interesting. My Aunt Ruth lived there, so you know, mm -hmm. plenty of contact. It was just right after the war, so the years were getting pretty good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And uh, what about junior high, high school age? What do you remember about those? I liked the plays. I was in plays, but I, I had allergies, like I said, and so I was very bashful, very shy. And so I was not in the in crowd, or whatever you want to call it. I went with my dad places. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I went to school and did my best and, awesome. and took piano lessons and that was about it. I I don't have any fond great memories of school other than That's, school plays. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Now growing up then you did not have electricity. Uh, we did out on the farm there. I there was in sixteen Green River. when we sold out in Green River. And then we looked for property all, all over here, and then we ended up at the ranch. And that was, there was nothing out there. Whoa. So we got the old ranch house, cleaned it up, and moved in. Kerosene lamps, packed the water, it had a cistern. You'd run the water into the cistern and put Clorox in it and huh. to purify it and bucket it out. Wow. How did you feel about that change when you were 16? Well, we'd spent summers on another old ranch down on the green in the San Rafael, so I didn't think a thing about it. Oh, so you were accustomed to roughing it. You knew how to get along. Well, I didn't even think of it as roughing it. In Green River, even with electricity, my mother made soap and heated water sometimes outside in the big tubs. So hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't that big a change, and so did everybody else mm -hmm. in the farming area. Just how they did things. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you uh, leave home? What what age and what were the circumstances when you left your parents' home? Well, tell her about going to Wayne High. Well, I did. When we sold out of Green River, I was 16. I lived with my aunt in, and went to Wayne High. My folks were still finding what they were going to do. And... Uh, I boarded out and came home in the summers, and that's when we, about when we brought the ranch, but to go to high school, then I lived with my aunt. I lived with, oh, two or three other people in Green River to wow. finish high school. Wow. So I was sort of on my own anyway. I see. And then, oh, let's see, the year after I graduated, why I got a job up in Orem at the Community Press, and I worked there until I got married. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, well, the Green River City 
Chamber of Commerce came to me. I was working there the summer after I graduated and wanted me to be the Miss Utah contest. And they bought my clothes. And my, I drove my folks for working down on oh, a construction crew. My mother was cooking down there. And I drove from Green River down there and said, told them what had happened. So my mother came back with me. They'd give me, I think, 60-some dollars to buy clothes. With. Oh, wow. And my mother came, and we got with the, with the wife of the mayor, and we went and bought some clothes, and we went up to Salt Lake, and I was in the Miss Utah thing. Oh, how cool. I don't know. I was never so scared in my whole life. But I, I did a dance. I made up the choreography, and I danced. And um, I was in the 19... Finalists. Wow. And uh, at that point, I thought, what would I do if I won? That would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to do it again. <laughs> I, I was never so out of my element in my whole life. Wow. But anyway, they had, uh, what was it, the, what do they call it in college where you're in, in the ROTC? That was it. They had these young men, they were the escorts. So, all I thought was, I'm a hick from the sticks. What am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you did well. I'm glad, I'm glad I did. And the following, the following, what was it? That was spring. Miss, they asked me to be in the Miss uh, Highway 50 Queen contest. Hmm. The uh, Chambers of Commerce on Highway 50, 6 and 50, got together, and they were trying to promote tourism or whatever and so they had queen contest and there was a, a gal from Selena, Kansas there was one from uh, I was in Pueblo, Colorado and me oh my goodness <laughs> and I did the same routine that I did at the Miss Utah thing but then I wasn't afraid I had a ball <laughs> oh cool <laughs> anyway it was quite an adventure they flew us over to Pueblo and the little gal from Pueblo that got first, because, you know, that was the host thing, and I got second, and I got suit and clothes, and, and an offer to go to Lake Tahoe, and I didn't ever go. Wow. But anyway, that's that adventure. How cool. Uh, you had to be pretty talented and confident to be able to do both of those things. I don't know, but I... I just, to tell you the truth, I've almost forgotten. <laughs> to oh, tell you yes. That's amazing. Mm. That's wow. great. How fun. Now, what? why did your father want to move from Green River to Hanksville again? Well, he grew up in this country. He was, a, you'd call him an old cowboy. His mother had died when he was 12, but he was pretty much on his own. He worked for the Robbers Roost Ranch. He worked for Moores. He herded sheep for Vern Pace. I mean, he, he survived mm -hmm. in, this, mm -hmm. in this country. And I guess he was about 27 when he met my mom. And, and her folks had been in Hanksville. He, just, he understood that kind of life. Horses were everything. Oh. And uh, to, horses were to him like, like a motor car or a motorcycle or the things that the boys like now that was mm -hmm. if you had a horse you had the world oh, neat. and that was just the kind of a person he was and he understood the ranching and so did my mom wonderful so that really those were his roots yes and the time he stayed in green river he just did that he ran a store he ran a farm he bought some cattle we rented and leased and ran cattle he did about everything. And all of that was so you could go to school? Well, pretty much, and they were just they were just starting out in their life, too, trying mm -hmm. to figure out what they wanted to mm -hmm. do. And so he did find a ranch in Hanksville. Well, was, he went back to the old ranch he'd worked on as a, as a kid. How great, and, <laughs> and now he owned it. Yeah, and he bought it. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great accomplishment. It was pretty run down. It is again, too. <laughs> But, yeah, they worked hard. And did you stay there with them and mm -hmm. we were part of the work? What was some of the work like? I didn't do much. Uh, 
they, they, when I got there, mostly we were cleaning it up, fixing the fences, and putting things in, and then I got married. Because mm -hmm. I'd met my husband, what, three and a half years before, and kept mm -hmm. telling him no. <laughs> anyway, and he, he had, when his folks left with the uranium thing, he stayed, he got a job in Price. Mm -hmm. And then he answered an ad, because they were looking for tech reps, Philco. And that was the training he had in the military with, oh, radar and electronics and things like that. And so he hired on and he ended up in Huntsville, Alabama, teaching radar systems and things like that. And he came back from Huntsville and hmm. thought he could marry me and take me away from all of that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and all I did was be homesick. I didn't realize the history we were in the middle of. Yeah. How exactly did you two meet? I know he came here to do the uranium mining, but what was okay. the actual... <laughs> Excuse me, my folks had just sold the, the farm in Green River, and they were in Hanksville, and sort of camping out at, the, at Rio Hunt's motel, and Don and his family had trailers there. Nice. And uh, they'd been there about a year. And when I came home from school on weekends, so I, there he was, and he says he saw me, and said, well, there she is, <laughs> so that was, that's what his story was. Anyway, and he got his sister to introduce us because his sister was being good friends with my mom. They had met and liked each other, and, and so he started courting. Terrific. That's great. Where did you live when you were first married? Huntsville, Alabama, Redstone oh. Arsenal. How, what was that like? Well. I liked it in a way. I was far from home. I was very homesick and very young, and so I, you lose part of yourself sometimes. And, but I liked the scenery. He took me all over. We went to old museums and fun places. Went out and listened to the Atlas rocket static fire, and it shook the whole town. Mm. I liked the fact that there were big nut trees all around, and you'd go up and pick nuts up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We weren't there very long, about six months, so, and then, then he got a job with RCA and we transferred to Fort Pachuca, Arizona, mm. and there he was teaching there. Mm -hmm. And his folks were in Tucson by then, so we had family close, and that was nice. Good, good. That, so you were a little homesick in Alabama. Oh, terrible. That's... I was homesick my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Any time you lived away from here. I was homesick. I, I, that was all there was to it. Mm -hmm. I did not live well house to house. Yeah, okay. yeah. And how long were you in Arizona? Uh, we were there until 61, the spring of 1961. And then he was transferred to Cambridge, Ohio, where he worked on the Minuteman missile side. My goodness. And. How'd you like Ohio? Those are insane little hills. <laughs> you don't know north from south. <laughs> oh, I'd get about two, half a mile away from home and I couldn't find my way back, so I didn't do anything or go anywhere without him. I, it all looked the same. It was all the same, and it was, uh, I didn't do well in Cambridge, Ohio. You have such dramatic landmarks here. Yes, you can see where you're going. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And his folks, by then his parents were in Detroit, so we got to go out and visit some of his people there. That's where he was from. Well, his parents moved around a lot. Oh, they just moved from, well, they moved from there. They were in Tucson for a while, and then they got homesick and went back to Detroit. I see. I see. Well, good. And then after Ohio? After Ohio, <coughs> excuse me, I took it sort of a leave of absence. And he brought us back to the ranch, and so we were at the ranch for well, about three, four, a uh, few months. Mm -hmm. And we filled out some resumes trying to get closer to home, mm -hmm. and so he applied with the FAA, hoping to get to an airport at Hanksville then. And uh, they accepted him, but they wanted him at the LA International Airport in Los Angeles, so we went to Los Angeles. We lived in Santa Monica, and he worked at LA International in the flight line calibrating flight equipment for the FAA. 
How did you like the Los Angeles? I liked that you could go to the beach and see. Oh, good. <laughs> I enjoyed that. You liked the ocean? I did. Oh. And uh, I ran into my mother's cousin there, so it was very pleasant. Good. Great. And how long did you stay there? Uh, let's see. From 62 to 75, 63 to 75. Mm -hmm. Not 75, I'm sorry. 63, 64, 1965. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You saw so much of the country. So much. Yeah, My we did. goodness. And then after LA, where did you go? Well, while we were there, they sent him to the FAA Academy in Oklahoma City. So we went there for three months while he went to school. Mm -hmm. Then we came back, and by then his mother had contracted the lung cancer. And she came and lived with us till she died. <clears throat> when she passed away, when they wanted to put him on nights, and he wouldn't leave us at night in the city. And so he quit, and we went back to the ranch. And by then, they had the missile site in Green River where they were firing down to White Sands, and so he hired on there. Oh. And we moved to Green River. Wow. Tell me about that. I'm not familiar with that. Oh. Well, they, they were testing, uh, oh, different, what do they call it? They had packages, they, you know, that they wanted to send up on a, on a rocket, testing things as part of the space program. Mm -hmm. And so they had about three different missiles that they were firing with different payloads down to White Sands. And he was head of COMO there. <coughs> Excuse me. What and is COMO? Communications. Oh, okay. You know, uh, where, where they... Well, set up the communications, and then they have the equipment that's going to track the missile. And uh, that was his responsibility. And when the missile fired, then they had to make sure they had all, uh, well, I can't remember all the names of the things that they did to track the missile and to guide missile guidance so it would mm -hmm. land where they wanted to, mm -hmm. which it didn't always. Once it went clear to the Yucatan, and boy, it was something. But now, are these live missiles? Oh, are yeah. they explo exploding? No, 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 no. They, they, they carried a payload into space, which uh, tested atmosphere. I don't know what. Oh, okay. And then, then after they got, received the information back, then the missile would land the rocket, whatever you want to call it, would land probably around White Sands in an in impact area. Hopefully where there's mm -hmm. no people. <laughs> exactly. But one time it went to Yucatan. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, there they, they were stages. And so the stages, they had to calibrate where the stages were going to drop. Because if it got too close to Moab or something, why then oh it was very, well, what? Chamber of Commerce didn't really like that I because it interfered with the tourists. <laughs> you just had this debris falling uh, from the sky. Had, we had to calibrate where it was going to fall. Wow. Anyway, that's what he did. Wow, how interesting. And so you were in Green River for quite a while? For then? seven years, uh-huh. And then they closed the base, and we went to White Sands. Oh. And we were in Las Cruces. Mm -hmm. And uh, there for quite a while? Oh, uh, we came back in 75, so we weren't there very long. And once <laughs> again, that was... I don't know you'd call it inspiration or whatever. He was sitting at his desk, he said, and he was planning on a, uh, a promotion that he had put in for. And he said uh, into his mind, that voice said, uh, what would you do if you lost one or all of your family? And he said, well, nothing's worth that. And then he said, well, and he told me, so I said, Lord, if I get this position, then I'll know everything's going to be all right. If I don't, then I'll take him back to the ranch. He didn't get the position. Oh. He was offered another one about a week later, but he'd already put in his termination papers and he couldn't go back. So he left his career and became a rancher. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and was this cattle ranching? Mm-hmm. Cattle, calf, and hay. And oh, it was hard on him. It was rough. Oh, had he ever done that? <clears throat> no. He grew up in Detroit. Oh, what a change. But he did it. Mm -hmm. 
How do you think he felt about that? Terrible. Really? <laughs> well, yes, he hated it. He didn't like it in the least. Uh, but he knew that the kids and my children, his children, and me, we knew we were happy and we liked it. And in a way, he sort of lost himself there, but he, he stuck with it until his son was big enough to take it over. Oh, your son did mm -hmm. take it over. Mm -hmm. Now, how many children Two. did you have? You have a son and... And a daughter, huh? And a daughter. Daughter's the oldest. How nice. And they're both there. Oh, that's great. They had decided to stay in mm -hmm. Hanksville? Yeah, my son went on a mission to Taiwan, and when he got back, he says, I can't stand a city anymore. <laughs> I would so, think. So he dug into the ranch. Did your husband feel successful at the ranching? Uh, we were for a while, and we hit the drought, and then some of the laws changed on grazing, and so he did not feel successful. He felt very disappointed, and he, and he felt like he'd wasted part of his life. That was his hmm. feelings. How did you feel about coming back? I felt like I was in one piece, finally. <laughs> I, felt, I loved it. Yeah. I loved the mountain. I loved the, the whole thing. You, you had always been homesick for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Hmm. That's great. I don't know if it was great. If I'd have been a really diligent wife, I'd said, sweetie, if you're not happy here, well, put in another resume and we'll go. But... I couldn't make myself do it. And your children loved it? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, my daughter loves horses. And, and she... How old were your kids when they came? When they came back? To, back to the ranch, yeah. Oh, see, my daughter was 14, and he was what, nine, going on 10. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they were young. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess, is your husband still living then? Oh, no, he passed away a week ago. Oh, no, you're kidding. Oh, that's so no, recent. No, he, yes, it is. Oh, it's I'm so sorry. Recent. He, he had a melanoma, which he ignored and thought he could take care of himself. And the time he got it removed, I had it, it had spread. Oh, how nice of you to do this. But that was only about two, oh, about two, three years. But he, he had a, a large parotid tumor also mm -hmm. that had developed. And so he had a very rough time about the last 10 years if he had done something about it. Right. He would have lived longer, so it's... Well, I'm, I'm so sorry. But it's... But he joined the church before... Oh, wonderful. And took me to the temple, and so I've had a miracle. That is. That is wonderful. Now, are you comfortable? I, I have you, to move a bit. because Is I, your hip hurting? Well, I've got two hips, <laughs> so I move, I move around. Don't worry about me. Are you sure this is what you want? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> this is wonderful. Well, how did you meet Lula Bettinson? Uh, in Green River, and we were living, that's when my husband was working at the base there in Green River, and uh, there was a lady named Eula Gillis, and she had taught my father when he was in grade school, <clears throat> and she taught me when I was in grade school, and uh, I'd go visit her. Mm -hmm. She was one of them that, that encouraged me with dancing and the things I love to do. <clears throat> and so. One day she calls me on the phone and she said, Butch Cassidy's sister is here, would you like to meet her? And so I went over to her house and there was Lula and, and I got to visit her. And, and you see, this Una Gillis was a cousin to Lula Bettinson. Oh, so Gillis, that... She was a Gillis and the Gillises and, and the, oh, what was his name? <laughs> anyway, Butch's family. His, his, was his mother a Gillis, something like that. Anyway, was was he a Parker? Yeah, he was a Parker, and his mother was a Gillis. His mother oh. was a, a sister to Una's father. Oh. So the family knew each other from the get-go. So sh your teacher was a cousin to Butch Cassidy? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. 
And what kinds of things did they talk about with you? Oh, well, Lula was just there visiting. It was a family visit sort of thing. And anyway, she was just mentioning that she was going to write this book and tell the truth. And, and, that, and that was really about it. But it was interesting to meet her. And there was no doubt in her mind that that person who visited her oh, was yes. Butch Cassidy. Oh, yes. He asked about his mother. I mean, it was, it was a family. Well, he'd written, he'd written letters over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, they knew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no question. Mm -hmm. No questions. Isn't that amazing? And did she talk about other aspects about him? Not particularly. She was only two, I think. And she said it in her book when he left, mm -hmm. so she didn't remember. <clears throat> but she knew what her folks talked about. And, and she tells his story, I think, very accurately, mm -hmm. why he left and mm -hmm. who he was. And, and does she say where he's buried? They won't tell, but I gather it's around Oregon or someplace like because he was up in the Oregon area mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. maybe around in that's mm -hmm. Interesting. And so after that first visit, did Lula have contact with him then? That's what I understood, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, wow. That's amazing. That's true. I never thought a thing about it when it was <laughs> happening. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me about your life on the ranch. Here you'd been all over the United <laughs> States, and then you came back, and what kinds of facilities did you have? We still had water out of the ditch and uh, all of that, and my husband and I, we went to work and started to fix the house up some more. He'd, he'd done some things for my mother. He had built some kitchen cabinets, and he had uh, made it so when you packed the water in and put it in the... In, in the sink, it would run out and you wouldn't have to pack it back out again. <laughs> but he'd done some things like that. But anyway, we remodeled the whole house, and one of the first things he did, there was a lot of... Okay, my folks had sold the ranch a bit before, and the people had let it go. The ditch was completely covered with Russian olives. The dam was almost out. I mean, he we grubbed out all of the weeds and the trees that had grown up. We remodeled the house. We went clear around the place, repaired all the fences. Mm -hmm. And my, my dad helped. He tried to get, we started out with 15 head of cows. And it was an irrigation system, so we had clean ditches. And, and that's in the spring, you get the water in the ditch, you'd clean all of the ditches and set the dams. And then when you put it onto the field, you had to mark the field out and then walk the water through the furrows. And, and we did that, we raised hay. And we built the cow herd up, and we were doing really, really well. And then it quit raining. Mm. About it was about 1987. It just dried up. We got all that rain in about 83, and you know it was swamped, and they bought and it was something, and then it just quit. Mm. And so we struggled. We sold down, and about that same time, the BLM decided to enforce some laws that they'd signed and they got rid of the old Taylor Grazing Act which allowed you a mile around your private property for grazing. They got rid of that and so we didn't have enough grazing property. We had two sections on that was it so we couldn't do that anymore. We ended up in court because cows don't know where the lines are right. and uh, we got that straightened out and then during the drought we went ahead and the original ranch had three different diversions, and my dad had, had the lower one. Well, during the drought and the floods and so forth, it washed out, and so the water was subbing, it was sinking before it hit the bottom diversion. So we applied with the state to activate, reactivate um, the other higher up diversions where there was water. And so we did that and uh, negotiated with the BLM because the They'd put it in the wilderness study area. Uh -oh. So anyway, we had, we got water rights and fixed the ditch lines, the old ditch line that came up from up higher, and then uh, looked into getting a pipeline, find out that if you put it in a the pipe, then you lose your grandfather rights, which 
they dictate to you when and how you can use your water. Uh, so we didn't do that, and uh, and we just sort of limped along. And, uh, my folks were living with us part of the time then, and then they went on a mission to go to the Dakotas. Hmm. And um, then our son went to Taiwan, and when he got back, well, we began to turn things over to him, and we just sort of coasted for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we couldn't get much income from the ranch at the time. Um, why were some of these regulations in place? Do you think they were trying to get rid of ranchers? Mm -hmm. That, it was the environmentalist push. They wanted they wanted to make a playground out of it and preserve it. And, you know, the battle still goes on, multiple use right. and all of that. Right. But, but that way they could shut down the ranchers. Mm -hmm. you think yeah, with that this was... wilderness, they can get rid of the ranchers. They can get rid of the property. Mm -hmm. They did it in Arizona a lot. Mm. There I were see. some fabulous, beautiful ranches down there that were just sort of squeezed out and taken over. Mm -hmm. Now, are you still living on that same ranch mm -hmm. then? I am. Oh, that's neat. That's neat. And is your son operating a mm -hmm. cattle ranch? He owns the Hollow Mountain, a business, a gas station, a convenience store mm -hmm. at the junction of 95 and 24. And that's the main source of income for him. And the ranch is sort of on the side, and he does what he can when he can. And mm -hmm. so the fences need fixing again. <laughs> And all of that. That's continual, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's hard work. Don's brother-in-law came out and looked around when we were running the place, and he says, all I can see around here is work. <laughs> <laughs> but I will. Tell them the kind of things that you can plant, that you, the kind of okay. trees that you have. Well, when, I, when we came back, I wanted to see what would grow there, and I got pecan trees. and. I bought everything I could think of to see what would grow and what wouldn't grow. Because you love the nuts from the south, mm -hmm. huh? You got it. Anyway, and the gardens, we made oh, gorgeous gardens. At that time, we had my folks had planted quite a few trees, and I sold peaches. And, mm -hmm. But the drought thinned out the orchard. We're just now getting it built back up and trying to get it productive again. Mm -hmm. It's taken all this time. Sounds beautiful. My daughter-in-law loves to garden, so we have lots of fun together. Wow. So uh, your daughter-in-law and son live there mm -hmm. with you? Yeah, they live next door. Oh, nice. How nice. And you have grandkids? Mm -hmm. We have three grandkids that live on the ranch, and I've got six more. Well, two of them are off on their own, but in town that to come out and spend time. And it's my granddaughter that's living with me. She wants the house. Well, she <laughs> wants the ranch. <laughs> so, I think. How old is she? She's 20. Oh my god. And she says, so I say to her, well, what color shell do you want your living room? <laughs> and we'll do it. She's waiting for a missionary, and then they'll see if there's anything to their friendship or not. And then mm -hmm. she loves music, and she'd like a career in music. But right now she's beating time. She works for her uncle at the gas station and lives with me right now. Wonderful. How nice. So your husband was very correct about coming back for the family. For our sakes, yes. Sounds like. I decided the Lord loved him, and, and so he wanted us to be happy, but mm -hmm. no, it's, been, it's been a long journey. Mm -hmm. And what kind of services do you have now? You have solar we panels. Have, we have solar, uh, solar panels, that, uh, and so we have regular power. Mm -hmm. Run 110, and I, so we have lights. You have to run a generator to run a washing machine because we haven't yet got quite enough panels oh. to and battery bank to do mm. that. But we have the, the generator for a backup. Interesting. And so after you've lived all over the United States, though, you still wanted to come back here, even though you were doing without a lot of those conveniences. Mm -hmm. You were drinking water out of the ditch. We were for a while, but now, now we have, we we drilled a well. Mm -hmm. We drilled a well, and we have a tank. And mm -hmm. My actually, my dad had a well there too, but it had a windmill and a pump on it, and it wasn't plumbed into the house. Oh. But now it is. Well, great, great. 
That's a tremendous lot of work. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work to go into a place to make it like that. Wow. It needs a lot of work more. Mm -hmm. Well, wonderful. And um, anything else about the history of the area or anything that... Because you are a Robison, mm -hmm. so your family has been here for a long time. Yes. Um, what kinds of things do you think are important to know about the area? Uh, that, that's a difficult one. What would anyone be interested in? It was hard work, and, but it was free, freedom. Uh, my grandfather ran goats on the Henry mm. Mountains, Angora goats. Wow. And uh, my father was with, with his bigger brothers in the goat business. And to make a living out of a desert country is quite a challenge. Yeah. But they did it. I, I really can't think of what would be important to record. Is there's stories, now, but... What did they do with the goats? It wasn't milk. Was it hide or meat? Angora goats. The Angora fur. Yes, that, that's... Uh, so they'd shear them just like uh -huh, a sheep. And, uh -huh, and bundle it all up and... Oh, what's the name of cashmere? It's like cashmere. Mm -hmm. They used it for that. They stuffed couches with it. They tried to push the, the meat. They call it chivo. But people just didn't catch on to go meat. for it, huh? Interesting. You know, he, he, went, he went bankrupt because hmm. of the market. They raised him. And he caught him out of Texas somewhere. My dad never knew quite where. Hmm. That was part of what he did. Uh, they, the original land, they had it in Blue Valley. Uh, called the town of Giles. That's where my grandfather was. His first wife, they had had a family, and she died in childbirth, and then he advertised, and my grandmother, my father's mother, came from South Dakota. Her husband left her with two little boys, and so she came out, and they got married in Green River and ended up in Giles, Blue mm. Valley. And I hear that she sat on that blue hill and cried. <laughs> <laughs> she says, talk about hard life, because she, she was a nurse and, you know, lived, used to city life back then. That was in 1907. And my Aunt Ruth was born there in 1910, and then they moved on into Hanksville. My dad was born in Hanksville. About 1916, they moved to Green River. I'm writing my dad's journal. He wrote everything down. He recorded his, all of his memories. In the, in the journal, I wished he'd have kept, he burned because he afraid somebody might get a hold of it and sue him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I could have written a Louis Lamar out of that one. He really did write a because lot of Because he was things. in the bootlegging days and the cowboy and he worked for all the sheep outfits. And what I have is interesting. He wrote down all of his memories and he talked into a tape recorder and I transcribed it and now I'm trying to get it on, cool. on a computer. And my mother, my mother's people... And they were, they were in Henryville, and during the cotton boom, I guess that was in the 1920s, why he uh, sold his cattle, and uh, they went to Arizona around Phoenix, and he thought they'd invest in cotton. About the time they got down there, why then the cotton boom was over. I don't know just what happened. So with teams and wagons, they came back, and they helped Work on. They worked on the Salt River Canyon when they were building the road down through there, and when they came back, they went to Price, and my mother remembers that. Hmm. And then he thought he would try to get back in the cattle business, and they came to Hanksville, and uh, and so my mother was. That's where she met my dad, and he was running a, a what you call a pool hall, the CC camp through there. Oh yeah. And so he he was. <laughs> He was running the pool hall and pool tables, and not a pool table, but they played, they played, oh my, whatever you do. I've never been a good card player, so I can't remember yeah, all that. Yeah. I'm sleepy. Anyway, and he did that, he even had a slot machine. Really? A little bitty one. And I guess somebody reported, now here's the dead of Hanksville, far, far away. Anyway, somebody reported it, and here come the local. That was Raymond Maxfield. <laughs> came in and put his gun on his shoulder and said, Kelly, 
rip that and get rid of it. And so he couldn't play the poker games and all that anymore. <coughs> it was a pretty good business. It was. But the poker games just went back up to the CC camp and it kept on. They just didn't do it before that. My mom had to post all this there at that time. I can tell you one story. My dad did it twice. He had a pair of uh, pearl handled, you know, you call them six guns, I guess, whatever, revolvers. Anyway, there was a couple of fellows. One of them came in, and anyway, they played jokes on people. Anyway, so he said, look, I'm tired of you coming in here. And he drew one gun, and he says, I, I don't want to see you in here anymore, and I've had enough. And so he aims this one, and he fires the one in the floor. Oh. The <laughs> that was Bruce Acker. <laughs> Bruce still tells the story. He thought he'd met his end. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was kind of a world. Oh, was. my goodness. Oh, my. Anyway. So your dad knew who was bootlegging. Oh, yeah. And wrote it down in his journal. Oh, yeah, I can tell you another story. He was working at the Midland Hotel in uh, Green River. He was just a kid, probably about 16, something like that. And anyway, one fellow that rented a room there was doing that. They'd make it, I guess, out in the desert, and they'd bring it in, and, you know, jugs, and then they'd put it in little pint jars and then smuggle it back out and sell it around. Anyway, and he was having my dad fill jars and all of that. And so he... And anyway, they, somehow the landlady found out about it and told my dad, well, I've got you another job. You can go work for Wilcox's sheep outfit. But, but you're going to have to leave. And so my dad packed up his suitcase and he had one of those jars in his suitcase. Anyway, and so he got ready to leave and he left his stuff there because he was reported for work, I guess. Anyway, he had his brother-in-law go pick his stuff up. And as he packed it out, his little tin suitcase, there's a little trail. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it went out the door. A bit dripping out. <laughs> oh, and I've got that somewhere in, my, in his journey. That he wrote. <laughs> oh my anyway, goodness. so he worked for Wilcox's for a while and, and did everything, trying Ooh. to survive. Yes. They'd get on, they heard that they were hiring at Minturn, Colorado, and so he and his brother in law got on the train. And, you know, then you just got on the train, mm -hmm. call it Hobo, whatever, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. got off at Minturn and found out that they, they had hired enough, so they just had to get back on the train and come back. Mm. Uh, the stories he tells about it, I, it's amazing. He got awfully hungry sometimes between jobs and things but like that. But it has that. always been hard to make a living. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's hard to describe what that must have been like. I got the picture, like I say, I, I've had a good life. But I, I listened to my folks and what they talked about and what it was like then. Now, I guess part of the reason the government's going broke is because they're they're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got all of these, what they call them, safety nets or whatever. and So that kind of a life is not even understood. That kind of life of hard work and being mm -hmm. very conservative, frugal. very frugal. Yeah. People had to do that to they survive. Did. I can tell you another Butch Cassidy story. Oh, though. yes. My dad worked for a man named Andy Moore, and he had a, a big spread out there around the flat tops. And, uh, oh, I guess it was in the 20s sometime, 1924, somewhere in there, 25. I'm trying to, to get my dates right. Anyway, uh, Andy Moore was at his cabin out there, and it was evening, and a man rode in saddlebags and the horse and asked if he could stay the night and of course you do he stayed the night the next morning he got up early and he rode to the flat tops off in that direction and he was gone oh, i guess all that day maybe maybe longer i don't remember exactly when he came back um, and he said he he wouldn't let him touch his saddlebags or help him or anything he just took him off and stayed right there and the next morning he was gone but he went somewhere and filled the saddlebags, and who he was, we don't know. Oh, wow. And uh, there was a doctor in uh, Green River, Dr. Barton. He and his, his cousin, they ran the clinic in Green River, and they used to go out hiking all over. And under a little ledge, they found a cache. 
It was full of belt buckles and uh, things that, that a store would carry. All oh, sorts really? of things that somebody had taken and stashed. Oh, my goodness. So, huh. Know who it was that came with the saddlebags and got whatever there was and left? How interesting. We don't know, but you it happened. wonder how much stuff is hidden all over. Yeah, what, how much more. Wow. You don't know. That's right. That's right. Interesting. Can you think of any other questions, Rama? Oh, she's she's so full of stories. I mean, uh -huh. it's just her knowledge, I, I don't know. and she's very shy because she's one of the most talented people you'll ever know. Is that right? She plays the piano. She plays the violin. She plays. I mean, she's sort of. Cool. <laughs> she's very cool. artist. She's everything. Anyway. It sounds like but, it. I know you're, you're you're looking for history and stuff, and you know it's hard to just think of things. But we're looking for personal history, and this is what you've told us. It's fascinating oh. to see how your family have has done so many things and adapted to so many different situations to make a living and. Well, mostly, you know, nowadays you, you get a profession and you dig into that and you stay with it for 30 years or whatever mm -hmm. and, and then mm -hmm. retire and, mm -hmm. and we didn't do that. That's what my husband had in mind. He was going to have everything really mm -hmm. comfortable and mm -hmm. when he got his retirement, then we would live. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to live now. I didn't right. want to wait. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Well, how wonderful that he came back here for you. I am very grateful. And your kids. I am grateful for many things. And uh, when did your husband join the church? Last September. Oh, my goodness. And he had indicated to me last summer that he was thinking about it. And uh, we were, he started coming to church regularly with me. In fact, he started to come a little bit when I was called to the State Relief Society. But anyway, and then there was a, our board missionary. I said she just felt impressed to go ask him if he wanted to be taught the gospel. Because I, I, he said, indicated to me, well, do you go to the bishop? What do you do? And I said, well, I can, I can tell you about it. No, he wanted it from official. And she came up to the car and she said, well, Don, would you, would you be interested in, and uh, I would like to teach you the gospel, would you let me come? And he said, yes. Wow. So she did. Fabulous. And so they came once a week and they went through the missionary discussions. He had to use a hearing aid and it was not easy, but he, he listened. And he, he told a little bit of his story and so forth and he listened. And, and uh, then when they had finished, while well, she left the challenge, well, would you pray about it and so forth? And didn't say much, and a week or so went by, and she had uh, the whole wards. They asked them to please fast and pray on fast Sunday, so they did. And then finally, I, I asked him. I said, "Well, do you still want to be baptized? Do you think?" Well, yes. What's taking so long? <laughs> <laughs> and so they they had the uh, I guess it was the counselor in the Southern Utah Mission Presidency came and interviewed him and I oh I prayed and prayed and I thought oh, don't don't let him do something for the wrong reasons you know and uh, he interviewed him and said yes great and so we set up and he was his son baptized him hmm. and I thought well that's good and it wasn't a oh, what a month or so later President Pace came down and and spoke in church, and then he said after he lay, he came and you know said hello to us because he owns the property, but was his grandfather that owned that ranch to begin with. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and he said he went home that night and he couldn't sleep. He said, I, "Isn't there some way they could go to the temple? Because he's not going to live a year to wait that long." And so he sat down and wrote a letter to the first presidency and told the situation and oh, well, within a week I mean it's like three days later he got the answer I mean that fast and they said assuming he knows the policies and the procedures of the church yes oh. so with that letter in hand I said to my husband do you 
still want to go to the temple. Yes, that's what this is all about. I want to take to the temple. And uh, I said, so we set things up. And then the Sunday before, he fell, and he cracked his ribs on the tub. And I thought, oh, that's that. He was getting so weak then. And so we set it up for the following week and watched to see how he would do. And and we made it. He, and when we called the, the temple presidency, he said, come, come when I'm there. Because we told him that, you know, he's deaf. He has troubles and uh, in the situation, and he said, I'll, I'll take him through. So we went. And, and what temple? Monticello. There was no way he could have made it in the Manti Temple because of the stairs. This way they had a wheelchair, and he they didn't, have that. didn't have to move. Oh. So we went to Monticello, and these good people came. <laughs> oh, nice. And that, that is to see his face across the altar. And he said, she's my gift from God. Oh. That's what keeps me going. Beautiful. How beautiful. And your children were sealed to you. Mm -hmm. And he was sealed to his parents. I'd already done his parents' temple work, so he was sealed to his parents and his children as a family together. How wonderful. And that's what we did. And afterwards, he says, now how does it feel to be married for eternity? (laughs) <laughs> how lovely how lovely thank you for sharing that that's beautiful beautiful and then the next week we went he asked her if she wanted to go to, your oh. son had left her tell him oh that. well okay the following week we we made it he says we, we need to get to church so we made it to to sacrament meeting and then he, he I had to take him to my daughter's where he could because he was hurting so bad. The following week, everybody had gone to church. I just, I knew he couldn't make it, and he got up, but it was a little bit too late anyway. He says, don't you think we ought to try to make and get ready and get to church? And I just said, sweetheart, I don't think you can make it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was just like the middle of last month. Oh. And he went downhill so fast mm-hmm. from there. Wow. She said she had been waiting for 52 years to have her husband say, don't you think we ought to go to church? Isn't that <laughs> amazing? Because I'd gone along all, all those years. He'd go once in a while, and he went a couple of times in Cambridge, a couple of times in Los Angeles, maybe once. And, you know, he never did go in, in Las Cruces with me, but I had the kids, so I thought it was good enough, I guess. And then... And like Celeste said, she says, this is the daddy I remembered when we were in California and going to the beach and everything. She says, like, I got my father back, and then he left. Oh, wow. He had a rough time. That's an amazing, amazing story, though. That's... Yeah, I, I, I still can't quite comprehend the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful story. When we went to the temple, the temple president said, boy, you must have really pulled some strings to get this. And the <laughs> son said, well, we had nothing whatsoever to do with it. We were happy when he joined the church. thought that was right. great. It was all the priesthood. And the bishop got the same impression. Is that there's something that can be done that they can go to the temple? That's that wonderful. Was, Maybe that's worth everything. That there is. is. And you understand that. Absolutely. Beautiful. Anyway. Beautiful story. Well, and thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to I don't, say or talk about? I or? can't think of anything because uh, I do my dad's story. But I don't know if, you, you, uh, if you're acquainted with, with Negri's history at all. It was, he was out of the U of U. And he came and interviewed my father, my mother, and a whole bunch of the old cowboys around Green River. They're all dead now. That he oh, my and goodness. I, I have a copy of his interviews. And I have another fellow came from the university and interviewed my folks. And 
And if you're trying to put together oh, some that'd of this, be you'd wonderful. be welcome. Oh, how fabulous. Yes. Some of this, and when I get my dad's story done. That would be wonderful. Anyway, this, my husband's children are trying to put together his life story so that their children will know. Right. The one son is a an army buff, World War II and all of that, and mm. he knows all, all the history of that. He can tell more about I wished I'd have written it down, but I never thought to. He told That's the stories right. over and over, and so you know, I should have written them down. You don't think about things like well, that. You sure. just take it for granted. Well, you're doing a few other things at the and, time. You huh? know, and I guess that's what, what we know. We don't really know a whole person's story until it's <coughs> done. That's right. Then you get a glimpse of who they really were. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mostly all we see is a rough, crusty outside. <laughs> the one thing about Sharon and Hanksville, um, <coughs> she loves Hanksville and she loves the old history of Hanksville. And she and her daughter, they're very talented people, but her, all of her grandchildren are very talented too. And so they try to keep the old traditions of singing along or singing oh. and they have the old church house down there, and so Sharon's family put on a Christmas program this year of singing. Oh, cool! And uh, they 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 didn't they like play. To do that. Yeah, they yeah, so, like to do that. Yes. Yeah. So well, she tries very hard to keep that old tradition. I really don't try; it just happens. Well, that's, that's true. cool. It's that sense but of it's community. That sense, huh? Yeah, it's that sense of community that she wants and her fa her daughter is also very much into that she like you know she would like to do things like that she's so tired though Alexa says she's going to get her mother and get her back in shape again. <laughs> <laughs> that's fabulous those traditions are wonderful huh? mm -hmm. they're very they, priceless they have a lot of those it's but trying to help the young people that's where we have to work because they do not understand a lot of this the importance of it. Mm -hmm. I wonder what it's like. What would they do? Look like they talked without that cell phone and the little iPod. Oh, they're yes. lost. Yes. And that's mm -hmm. scary. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Well, this will be a wonderful piece to yeah. have. That's great. Well, anything else you'd like to ask about? Or? I, I, you've done marvelously. Thank you so much. At the end of a very long day. I hope there's a scrap of something. There will be tons of things. Yes, yes. Thank okay. you. You're welcome.